I'd like to call to order the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, February 17th, 2022. Welcome back everybody in person. Um, we can all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight, uh, Trustee Galagos is uh, participating remotely. Uh, Mr. Attorney Mars, would you uh, fill us in on this, please? I understand uh, Trustee Galagos is uh, prevented from being here for uh, medical reasons following a recent uh, procedure and uh, pursuant to Village's Ordinances, Open Meetings Act, and uh, Village Policy, he is authorized to uh, participate remotely. Thank you. With that, Ethan, would you please call the roll? President Ballerine. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Trustee Marshawski. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Clarity. Here. Trustee Gallagos. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Mars. Here. Also present Village mm -hmm. Clerk Soul. Thank you. Um, President's report. Tonight I have one thing on my report. It's a resolution amending the Village of Riverside employee manual and recognize and establishing Juneteenth as a paid holiday in the Village of Riverside, County of Cook, State of Illinois. The Village Employees Manual has been updated multiple times since it's adopted in August 20, 2007. Most recently, the Employee Manual was revised on November 18, 2021, adopting the transitional, Transition Facilitation Incentive. The new revision being presented to the Village Board is recognizing and establishing Juneteenth as a Village holiday. The attached resolution outlined the importance of Juneteenth. It is important to note that the last revision to the list of recognized holidays occurred on December 17, 2007, when the village recognized Martin Luther King Jr. Day as a village holiday. I would ask for a motion and a second, please. I'll make a motion. Motion by motion. Trustee Evans. Second. second. Second by Trustee Hannon. Any discussion? Hearing none, Clerk Sewell, if you please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshaz. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Motion passes, thank you. Um, I would like to, if, if you would give me a moment to read this resolution. Whereas the village of Riverside, County of Cook, State of Illinois, the village is a duly organized and existing village created under the provisions of the laws of the state of Illinois and now operating under the provision of the Illinois Municipal Code and all the laws mandatory thereof and supplementary thereto with full power to enact ordinances and adopt resolutions for the benefit of the residents of the village. And whereas Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day, Jubilee, Jubilee Day, and Celebration Day is the oldest national day of commemoration of the end of slavery in the United States. And whereas on June 19, 1865, the Emancipation Proclamation was read to newly freed African Americans in the state of Texas, where the state of Texas was the last Confederate state to make and accept the proclamation. And whereas 49 of the 50 U.S. states, including the state of Illinois and District of Columbia, recognizes Juneteenth as either a state holiday or a ceremonial holiday and day of observance. And whereas Juneteenth commemorates both freedom from slavery in America and recognize the many contributions African Americans have made to society and to the world. And whereas Juneteenth symbolizes and advances the ideals of freedom from oppression and liberty and justice for all. And whereas Juneteenth celebrates, celebrations are a tribute to those African Americans who fought for freedom and worked tirelessly to make the dream of equality a reality and further recognize that the fight for freedom and equality continues today. And whereas these celebrations set aside time to reflect on and rejoice in the experience of African Americans while emphasizing education, achievement, and unity. And whereas the celebration of Juneteenth is inclusive of all races, ethnicities, religions, and nationalities and provides the opportunity for all citizens to acknowledge a period in history that has influenced and shaped today's society while recognizing that there is still work to be done. 
and whereas the village president and the board of trustees desire to recognize the historical importance of Juneteenth and its continued relevance across the nation and specifically within the village. And whereas it is further furtherance of this effort and, the, and to encourage village employees to educate themselves on Juneteenth's rich history and participate and engage in Juneteenth celebration, the village president and the board of trustees have determined that it is in the best interest of the village beginning June 19th, 2022 to recognize Juneteenth an official holiday in this village and establish June 19th as an annual paid holiday for all village employees. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the president of the board of trustees of the village of Riverside, Cook County, Illinois. Thank you. One other item I did, uh, I would, I sent everyone an email and I just wanted to uh, reiterate the fact if you would uh, allow me to recognize you uh, before speaking, it will make um, Ethan's job and um, legal's job much easier to transcribe our notes. So thank you. Uh, manager's report. Thank you, President Ballerine. I have a couple of items for this evening. First, very exciting, the Parks and Rec Department has been working really hard to update our registration system to allow for online registration for the summer camp program, which uh, has some levels of nuances, and that's why we had to work hard to get a system in place to allow for that. Um, so it'll allow for not only summer camp, but also in the fall for before and after school programming, which is fabulous. Um, also wanted to make note that currently registration is open for returning campers. Um, and Tuesday, February 22nd, beginning at 7.30 a.m., new campers that want to register can do so online. So that is very exciting and thanks to Parks and Rec and the staff involved with getting that project done. I also um, wanted to recognize Director Johns, the department heads, Assistant Village Manager Monroe, Analyst Ethan Soul, Analyst Ian Split for their work on the budget document, which the board has on the consent agenda this evening. A lot of work went into that document, a lot of hours of effort, not only by them, but also by the village board. And so thank you for everyone for those efforts. And it's a great document, so take a look. Um, it's a great planning document too and resource for the community as a whole. And my final item is I wanted to recognize Public Works um, for their efforts in late January and early February and actually this evening as well as they're removing snow as we're having this meeting. Um, what a lot of residents don't realize is prior to the February snow, on January 30th, uh, Public Works had to go out and handle two water main breaks where Public Works staff members were working for over 24 hours straight, getting that done, went home to recover, and then promptly had to come back out to then handle snow removal operations. So thank you to Director Tab, Superintendent Coons, and their entire team for handling all of that without even residents realizing all the efforts that were put forth. And that is all I have this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Manager Francis. Um, next on the agenda is resident comments for non-agenda items. Um, I would like to recognize uh, Ms. Schumacher because she would like to speak on, a, on a, um, an agenda item, but she is on call at the hospital tonight and is worried that uh, she will not be here uh, when the agenda item comes up. So Thank Schumacher, you, please. Your agenda is way at the end. So this is the Schumacher, morning. would you please come to the, oh. if you don't mind? Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. Hi, this is regarding a fence that um, they want to erect on 44 Kimbark to go around the property. It's a corner lot. It's at Forest and Kimbark. This is right where you come into town. I think this would be very detracting to our community. I don't feel it's in Olmstead's vision. Um, it also would block the sight line as you come out of Kimbark. Um, the alley that's there, you won't be able to see around it. And the property is actually higher than the alley is. I feel this would be a liability for the village. There is an existing fence that I own on the property line. It was grandfathered in. I've been in town since 1988. I do not have any intentions of taking this fence down. I do not want a fence placed next to it or on top of it. 
Um, <clears throat> also, I do have a concern that we are a National Historic Landmark, and I do not want to lose this status because I feel if this fence were to go up, it would probably be a snowball effect and we'd have more fences going up in town. So I'm just here to let you know that I don't really want this to happen on that property. And I thank you for your attention. I did send emails with some pictures to every trustee. Hopefully you guys received that. I sent it out on the 10th. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Schumacher. Thank and you if your you're time. still here at the, um, when it comes up, if you'd like to add to that, you're more than welcome. Okay, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, we have several items on here. Ratify the voucher list of bills January 20th, 2022. Ratify the voucher list of bills February 3rd, 2022. Approve the voucher list of bills February 17th, 2022. Approve Village Board of Trustees regular meeting minutes January 6th, 2022. Review fire, review and file fire finance public works December 2021 monthly reports. Review file fire and public works January 2022 monthly reports, an ordinance authorizing the adoption and publication of the official updated zoning map of the village of Riverside, a resolution authorizing the village manager to approve, to approve a change order for the not to exceed amount of $39,098.99 for the purchase of water during 2021, a res resolution authorizing the village manager to approve a change order for the not to exceed amount of 2188 for the central business district bicycle racks, a resolution authorizing the village manager to approve a change order for the not to exceed amount of 4952 for the purchase of a new snow plow, a resolution authorizing the expenditure of $150,000 for 2022 maintenance under the Illinois Highway Code, a resolution approving and authorizing execution of a 2022 tree and stump removal and emergency storm damage response services contracted with D Ryan Tree and Landscape Services LLC and authorizing the village manager to issue a purchase order or orders regarding name in the amount not to exceed 50,000 annually a resolution approving and authorizing exec execution of a 2022 site cyclic and de a demand tree pruning contract with D Ryan Ryan D. Tree Service and Landscape LLC and authorizing the village manager to issue a purchase order for orders regarding the same in an amount not to exceed 50,000 annually. A resolution authorizing the village manager to create a purchase order in the amount of $110,000 for Christopher B. Burke Engineering to provide professional design and construction engineering as part of the Selborne Road project. A resolution authorizing the sale or disposal of personal property owned by the village of Riverside. A motion to approve a resolution approving and authorizing execution of a crisis service agreement with President's Behavioral Health regarding crisis services and authorizing the village manager to issue a purchase order or orders regarding the same in the amount not to exceed $32,000 annually. A motion to approve a memorandum of agreement regarding lateral hires between the Village of Riverside and the Illinois Fraternal Order of Police Labor Council, Lodge Number 39. Motion to approve, motion to accept the 2022 budget document. And a motion to approve a special event application for the Boy Scouts Troop 24 drive through pancake breakfast to be held on March 5th, 2022. Do any of these items need to, re need to be removed by any trustee? Hearing none, uh, I would ask for a motion and a second, please. Motion made. Motion by Trustee Gallego, second. I'll second. Second by trust, Trustee Evans. Clerk So, please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marsh Asga. Aye. Trustee Hannah. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Gallegos. Aye. Aye. Motion carries, thank you. Department's board and commission reports. Uh, the Landscape Advisory Commission is presenting their proposed 2022 work plan. Uh, Chairperson Lambros was gonna be with us tonight and um, I believe because of the weather she is not. So uh, Director Tab will be, will be outlining this. Yes, thank you. I'll give a, uh, a brief summary. And of course, if anyone has any questions, feel free to email Lisa. She is more than happy to answer those. 
The LEC is focused on making sure we are exceeding expectations written in our duties to the Village of Riverside, Chapter 14. In 2022, we are focusing our efforts in collaboration with other commissions, village departments, organizations, as well as education and engagement with the public of our community and its unique history. We have a special year ahead of us celebrating Frederick Law Olmsted's 200th birthday. So we plan on tying our events to the National Olmsted 200 calendar to help promote Riverside. I am going to uh, just summarize a couple events on their calendar. And um, if you want to follow along, it is included in the packet. On March 5th, the LAC will be doing a, a seed starting class and a seed swap in collaboration with the Riverside Community Garden and Library. April 29th, they will be doing a Arbor Day tree planting in collaboration with uh, Department of Public Works and Mike Collins, the forester. In May, they will be doing another seed swap and plant swap in collaboration with the Riverside Community Garden and the Library. In the months of May and June, they will be doing a um, triangle uh, refresh, uh, actually two triangle refreshes in conjunction with a, the Girl Scouts. During the summer, the LAC will have a table at the Farmer's Market. In the month of June as well, there will be some training going on for commissioners in Swan Pond. The July 3rd uh, event, the LEC plans on doing a, a table or booth um, on the third and the fourth celebrations. During August, there will be uh, another cleanup of a couple of triangles within Riverside in conjunction with Floss. In September on the 18th, there will be the uh, annual picnic by the pond. In October, there will be a month long celebration of October which will be in conjunction uh, in collaboration with the Department of Public Works. Thank you, Dan. Um, I have one more paragraph, oh, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> I just want to make sure everything that Lisa sent me is right. Uh, we'd like to thank the Village Manager Jessica Francis and Village Clerk Ethan Soule for their help in connecting us with Parks and Rec and their input for some upcoming events we can promote through their Facebook page. We would also like to thank the Riverside Community Garden in the Village of Riverside Library for our upcoming promotion of seed swap and seed starting. We still have some open items with collaboration that are not finalized yet with Parks and Rec and Floss, but we'll update you when they are set. We are looking forward to 2022. And again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to email Lisa. She's more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Lisa. And thank you to the LAC Commission for, uh, for all the work they're doing. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, next up is pending business. Um, I have a commission I'm sorry. Report. Go ahead. Um, uh, Hauser and the TV Commission um, will be collaborating on a project. Our Riverside TV Commission member and Hauser Middle School teacher Karina Conscious will be leading an eighth grade class that will focus on creating content for Riverside TV. So. The commissioners will share their ideas for television content with the students and the students will use those ideas to create videos and every student will create a video and the final projects will be aired on Riverside TV. The class starts March 8th and Karina said she has over 30 kids enrolled in her two classes and we look forward to seeing what they come up with. Thank you, Trustee Evans. Um, and I apologize for not asking everybody if they had any other reports. Thank you. Is there any, any other trustees that would like to reports under commissions or boards? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to pending business. Um, we have two items. Uh, first is the Olmstead Overlook proposal by the Frederick Law Olmstead Society. Um, Director Tab, if you would start, and I know we have several people from the Olmstead Society here. Yes, I'll just quickly summarize. <coughs> The Frederick uh, Olmsted Society presented their initial proposal to the Village Board on June 17, 2021 for the installation of a planned grove of trees and bench to commemorate the 200th birthday of Frederick Law Olmsted. The Board asked the Frederick Law Olmsted Society to meet with staff and discuss the initial ongoing costs associated with the installation of the planned grove. As part of the proposed project, staff is offered to provide hoses for watering the trees to cover the cost of the water and to drop mulch at the site for volunteers to spread out as needed. The understanding is the watering for the first three years 
would be handled by volunteers. Therefore, the village would only incur the cost of the water, which is estimated to be less than $50 annually. The trimming of the trees would be handled by the village forester for the first 15 years. The trimming would take place during normal business hours and an estimated four hours every five years. Village staff provide a notification to the residents along Fairbank Road between the Presbyterian Church and the Plains River Bridge. Uh, staff did receive three comments, which were all in favor of the project. If the board would like, I could read those. Otherwise, they are in your packet, uh, two of which were included, and then everyone should have received the third one today. So if anyone would like me to read those, otherwise, um, they are in the packet. Okay, um, without further ado, Kathy Maloney. All of them, okay, yeah. perfect. Hello, my name is Yvonne Lucero. I'm the current president of the Olmstead Society. And these are really three quick observations on the Olmstead Overlook Project. Number one being that given that 2022 is the 200th anniversary of Olmstead's birth and Riverside is his first planned community, the Overlook seems a unique and fitting tribute to the evolution of landscape design in the United States. The, F, the Floss are not aware of any similar plans within Olmstead's many existent works for the addition of a small and um, nominal grove that would be designated as a, as a specific site. The proposal and financial plan passed with a clear majority of votes at previous Floss meetings, and Floss wishes to reiterate that the project will be funded and maintained for the critical uh, initial three years by Floss volunteers, including watering, as indicated by climactic conditions. This represents an estimated 200 hours of volunteer time equated with approximately $10,000 of hourly effort. Um, this is an estimate that's based on typical grant allocations. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yvonne. Ms. Maloney. Thank you. Uh, just to add on to it, um, the site that was chosen, uh, we, we chose in concert with uh, Public Works Director Tab and Mike Collins of Forrester uh, to offer the best accessibility to the public. So it was a spot that everyone could see and enjoy collectively. And we want to thank Dan and Mike uh, and Jessica for guiding us through the process. Uh, the Overlook recognizes Olmsted as the father of American landscape architecture, so it was important to us that this was a professionally designed grove uh, to represent landscape architecture at its best. And so it's a naturalistic design that includes all native trees, uh, and it can be used as an example and a teaching example as we go forward. Um, and lastly, it, we wanted to do something like this um, to recognize Riversider's favorite use of the green space. Uh, we conducted a poll four years ago or so of Riverside residents, members, and non-members non of Floss and asked what do they like best about the greenery in Riverside, and they said they just like to look at it. So hopefully over the course of the next 100 years, uh, Riversiders and visitors will be able to enjoy the overlook. Thank you. Mr. Finn? Hello, I'm Bob Finn. Um, I live at 237 Blackhawk. Um, I've been a longtime volunteer with the Olmstead Society and was recently on the, the Olmstead board. Uh, most of the volunteer efforts have been involved with landscape work days, either with the Olmsted Society or like the RB Day of Service out at Patriots Park, or one of the big projects over the years has been Riverside Road. And I will be involved with the Olmsted Overlook, watering, mulching, planting, whatever's, whatever's necessary to keep those uh, plants alive. And I certainly support the project and look forward to it. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Finch. Um, good evening. I'm Dan Murphy. I'm also a volunteer and board member with the Olmsted Society. Um, I moderate the um, or edit the newsletter, and um, also um, am involved in a 
coordinating the presentations that the uh, society gives uh, to the community at no cost, uh, partnering with the Riverside Public Library. So there's little I can add to what, uh, what comments have been given before other than uh, I think we're here seeking the opportunity to contribute to the community once again in a unique way that aligns with both our mission and uh, the needs and interests of the community. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We appreciate everything that FLOSS does, um, and we appreciate you be, being cognizant of the village budget and working to get volunteers to take care of it. And uh, uh, I appreciate Yvonne giving me a call today and giving me uh, all the highlights and questions, so I appreciate that. Um, trustees, any, anything you'd like to add? Trustee Evans? Um, I, did, I did note in one of the letters that we received um, that um, the writer was concerned about the parking and um, it might be a good idea for us to take a look at that and see if we need to make some adjustments to accommodate the overlook. Okay. You know, speaking of parking, I was thinking about this today. We we're supposed to put two handicapped parking spots um, at the end of the trail. Uh, Public Works and the Police Department will be assessing that area and um, re kind of in response to the resident pointing out a number of uh, things, we're going to be looking at the signage in the area along with the, uh, the handicapped accessible spots. So that uh, that will be this spring. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Director Tapp. Anything else? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Trustee Hannon. Uh, one of, and it's sort of cryptic, so I reached out to Mr. Bryant um, and heard from some other residents on Fairbank uh, with, with concern about the uh, overgrowth uh, situation that they routinely have uh, on the hill going down. So wondering if part of this, um, uh, Grove project, which, which in just looking at the array of trees that are on this project, I'm very excited about it and really looking forward to it, uh, but was wondering if we could somehow integrate a, you know, that whole line to make sure that the overgrowth, you know, doesn't block out the, the beautiful view that we have that we're trying to highlight with this. So if that can be integrated, um, you know, e either through Director Taub or, or through the Olmstead Society just to make that part and parcel with the project. I think that'd be helpful and well received. Okay, thank you. I, so I agree. If I could comment on that real yes, quick. Yes, sir. Um, I walked the area with uh, Forrester Collins and we did look at the area in response to that comment. And while there is definitely patches of some invasives, uh, buckthorn in particular, there are uh, some regenerative natives in the area um, and the topography of the <laughs> pond itself uh, doesn't necessarily lend it itself to um, observing the river easily because of the terrain as it slopes down to the pond and the different elevations to which the trees are planted the canopy of the trees um, inherently block the view due to the staggered planting of them so while some of the, the lower invasive brush, such as um, you know, buckthorn, like I mentioned, can be removed, it doesn't necessarily mean there will be a line of sight to the river just due to either the natives or the um, staggering or tearing of the tree canopies. So I just want to put that out there that while some of the, you know, the invasives can be removed, it may not solve the issue of a clear line of sight to the river. I've also heard people say that they would like the, the river bank worked on more. Um, is that something that we can do or, or are we limited with that with um, the river? So I'll point to a previous project. There was uh, a bunch of buckthorn removed as part of a Girl Scout project along the river. And after going back to that site a number of years later, it had all eroded out because there was no vegetation holding the, the dirt there. Um, in turn, that happened to be one of the sites during the Swamp Pond Path where we had to reinforce it with limestone ledge rock was a, a site that Bugthorn had been removed. So while um, we would always like to enhance the view of the river, there's potentially a negative side effect by removing the vegetation because erosion occurs. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Hannon, please. Yeah. What, uh, Director Traub, first of all, thank you for those comments. It was helpful. I think the main concern is not the, the tree level, but, but the undergrowth and, and 
uh, you know, described as overgrowth. And if I could just read the comment, you know, someone who was saying they were very for the um, uh, Grove, uh, his concern is that it'd be like buying a beautiful necklace for someone that needs a haircut and a shave. So I don't know how you buy, do that, but I don't want to think about it too hard. So I think it is the undergrowth, and I think it's part and parcel with the, the project here to make sure that whole area uh, to the extent it can and you know understand the tree issue completely I think it's more ground level you said the buckthorn and there's other things that kind of make it look a little unkempt during the the, the, the you know summer and fall seasons we will work uh, in conjunction with the forestry department to see if we can't um, as time allows um, address that situation thank you director tap any other questions trustees I have no other questions, but I would just like to thank everybody involved for this um, collaborative effort. And I think it's going to make a really, really positive impact. And, um, and it will be unique among projects uh, that are happening for Olmstead 200 across the country. So thank you, Trustee Marshaska. Um, we move on to our next. Um, item on pending business is an update on the proposed text amendment. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Kathy, please. I'm sorry. So I don't know, are we voting today on this, or does that happen next week, or next meeting? It's, this was only. the only issue is I, I, it have, has to, to, it I has have to order the trees, because they're rapidly running out of stock. If it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. We, I think you got a thumbs up from the village board. I mean, does this not have to go through preser um, preservation in LAC yet? No, because it's not a hardscape permit. Even for the, the bench, correct? The bench has the to. The bench will that's have to, but that's piece. going to be a later stage. That's right. Yes. Right. So yep. we're just talking about the trees. So I, I don't want to speak for, for the board, but it seems like there's consensus to move forward. Staff has reviewed it and don't find any issues. And obviously it would be done in coordination with public works based on the responsibilities outlined. Would it be best if we call the roll? Could we do that? I mean. You, you could. OK. Yeah. Ethan, would you please? Uh, we uh, yes, we have a motion. We have a motion. Yeah. have a motion and a second to accept uh, the Olmstead Overlook as planned. Uh, I move to accept the Olmstead Overlook as planned. Thank you. Second. Trust, trust. <laughs> made motion by Trustee Marsh Osgus, <laughs> second by Trustee Galagos. Ethan, if you please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshazga. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank, thank you, you all for very everything. Thank you very much. We'll keep you posted. Thank, thank you. you. And Yvonne, again, thank you for the time today. I appreciate that. Um, second thing on pending business is an update on the proposed text amendment, accessory structured permitted use. Um, assistant, oh, me, yeah. Francisco, yes. please. Uh, okay, so at the November 18th, 2021 meeting, the Village Board uh, deferred an ordinance approving text amendments to the Village Code regarding accessory structures and use standards. The discussion at this meeting led to an agreement by the Board for Trustee Pollock to act as a liaison with staff in exploring a more comprehensive approach to the code sections and refinement, refinement of proposed code language. As requested for the February 17th meeting tonight, this memo offers a brief update on progress for further review of this draft text amendment. Uh, Trustee Pollock and planning staff have met since November and reviewed areas of the draft language that may require additional research or further consideration. A general summary of the major items planned for more review um, included researching how zoning amendments um, and communities are accommodating the rise in work from home professions um, and possible ways to tailor ordinance language appropriate for Riverside, analyzing current building design and construction requirements to determine what structurally would be necessary to allow habitable non-sleeping space and accessory buildings if an alternative use is desired. Staff has reached out to the building inspector and we spoke to, um, to, to TPI today um, with regards to what would be necessary um, if, if, if somebody wanted to um, put a, if they had the required height and space in an accessory structure um, and they stated that it would have to follow um, whatever building code is, is applicable to the, to the, to the village um, in order to convert, say, like a space that's already existing in a garage that's above a garage. Um, 
we also looked into refining language for clarity, um, and there's also a chart in the packet that um, includes some, some nearby communities um, and how they um, make, uh, how they regulate principal uh, building bulk regulations um, and, oops, sorry, refining language for clarity and inserting charts that make accessory and principal building bulk regulations easy to interpret and explain and then researching comparable communities ordinances to better understand how accessory structures are defined and regulated. Um, and we also inquired if recovering, requiring covenants to ensure that accessory structures are not used as habitable dwellings would be a mechanism to better enforce uh, current ordinance. Um, and there is a chart, it's a chart in the packet um, of nearby communities um, and some um, and information regarding you know the height requirements that that they have for accessory structures, if they limit the number of structures on a property, um, whether or not they have a definition of an accessory structure. Um, some of them do. They tend to be pretty similar in that accessory structures are all subordinate subordinate to principal use structures, um, and also if habitable space of a garage is allowed, most of them are the all of them are, they don't allow, with the exception of Oak Park, in that Oak Park allows uh, coach houses, um, depending, there are requirements that they have, you know, the, the lotage of, the lot area has to be a specific um, of size, square footage, um, and no more than one coach house is allowed on a lot, um, and other communities also limit the number of structures, you know, they, one detached garage and one accessory structure, so it kind of depends on what um, community it is, but they, mo most of them do have just, the most common one is, is a height restriction, but um, no limit on to how many structures can be on a lot. So, any questions for me? Thank you, Francisco. Yep. Doug, would you, uh, Trustee Pollock, I'm sorry, would you like to add something to? Sure, uh, just real quick. I, we've, we've made progress, uh, the key issue here is whether or not we want to expand how residents use accessory buildings, detached accessory buildings. Currently, they're very restricted. You can put your cars in there, you can store, uh, you can, if you have a pool, you can have a pool house. Uh, they're basically restricted to storage. And so what we're looking at is if there's an opportunity to expand that, the use, still keeping it accessory to the residential use, but allow people to make better use of those buildings. Um, for example, a uh, resident may have a, uh, may want to put an office above a garage or beside a garage next to it, not necessarily above it, um, or, or a hobby shop, hobby shed. Uh, a variety of uses, uh, not including, we're not looking at dwellings, we're not looking at accessory dwellings at all. Uh, if the village wants to look at that, it would be my recommendation to take that separately at another time. Uh, and so, yeah, we're making some progress. I think that by the time of one of the next or following meeting, we'll be able to come to the village board with very specific uh, suggestions, recommendations for, uh, with with the recommendation to uh, forward that to the Planning and Zoning Commission for their review, um, and then and then we'll get into the details of, of what we're actually considering. Thank so, you, Trustee Yeah. Is there any questions from any trustees? Uh, do they are comfortable with uh, what's how we're moving, how they're moving forward, how staff is moving forward? Okay, uh, Michael, what do we need to do to, this was tabled to today, so we need to. Well, I, I don't think, did we table it specifically today? It's so different from what where we started. We are gonna need a new public hearing ultimately. So okay. um, we'll bring an ordinance back here. Once everyone's comfortable with it, refer it to PZC and set up a public hearing. Okay, so um, do you want to, do you think that the next, the first March meeting or the second March meeting is more um, Probably attainable? Second. Probably the second March meeting. I agree. Yeah. Just for the purposes so of, nice with everything of you have cleaning to do. up the language and right. meeting with Trustee Pollock again, we, we did learn a little bit more detail from 
um, discussion today after we we put out the memo about building construction, and we can add that into our our discussion, and we'll bring it back for with like a redlined version for further discussion by the board. Okay, thank you. So let's put it on for the second meeting in March. Is that good? Should I do? Do I need a motion to table it to March seventeenth? No. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you for the work. I, I know it's just a it's a multi layered can of worms yeah. that keeps opening up. So I, I, I appreciate all the work that's going into this. So thank you very much. Yep. Um, under new business, we have s several items. Um, first under consideration is of the Planning and Zoning Commission findings and recommendations to deny a variation for construction of a fence on a corner lot and street yard at 40 um, Kimbark Road. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Mr. Scheinman is here. Is he? Okay. I think he's How are we doing? Good, good, Mr. Shaman. All right. Francisco, if you could walk us through this, please. Yep. All right, so the property owner, property owner, excuse me, John Shaman, uh, submitted an application for a variation at 40 Kimbark Road. The variation request is for a privacy fence up to six feet in height on a corner lot and in a street yard. Um, the act of building the privacy fence on both the corner lot and in a street yard will require a variation. Um, the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission received six letters from the public in opposition to the proposed fence. Um, during the meeting, the commission brought up concerns regarding visibility near the alley, which is to the west of the property, um, and the petitioner's garage driveway, um, especially when the driveway is being in, in use um, or if the alley is being used. Um, there was a brief discussion among the commission regarding the Olmsted plan, Olmstead plan and what impact approving the variation would have on the village's landmark status, uh, but they arrived at no conclusion as to the extent of any potential impact. Um, the proposed fence would enclose the entire yard that faces Forest Avenue on the south. Uh, the fence would be built up to the property line, um, which in this case, the sidewalk is the, is the property line and would be a, you know, a privacy fence up to six feet in height on that end of the property. Um, there's also a proposal of putting a uh, privacy fence on the northern end of the property next to, I believe it's 44 Kimbark. Um, the ordinance specifically states that fences are prohibited in street yards, except where a street yard adjoins a non-residential use or along a handful of streets, which in this case would be 26th Street, 31st, or York Road. Um, and additionally, the fence is currently proposed um, would encroach into the site triangle that is required by village ordinance on corner lots to be free of any obstructions. Um, and so we received some letters from the from the commission uh, from neighbors that were um, opposed to the fence, and then also during the commission meeting, you know, there was that concern of um, the sight line and obstructions. Um, and so we met with uh, Trustee Pollock, came with um, a proposal, which is in the in the packet, which would enclose the. The, the back or the the yard, um, 40 feet from the um, from the corner. So there's there's a on the survey there's a, a sidewalk there. So it would enclose that portion of the property all the way to the back of the alley. Um, this proposal has um, a four foot fence with open spaces, open spacing, and then it would also still have that six foot privacy fence on the north end of the property. Um, the petitioner also came a couple of weeks ago um, with their with a proposal um, a little different than what Trustee Pollock had, um, and that this is also I, I sent this um, I put this in the packet I believe, um, and it would be similar to Trustee Pollock's except it would extend all the way down to the sidewalk. It would also be four feet um, and would also be open. Um, so that is the um, that is the brief overview of the petition. Okay. Um, Mr. Scheinman, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah. When I had the meeting, there's seven other properties that have similar fencing to what this is, so I'm not reinventing the wheel of what's happening. Uh, as far as some of the code, even buying the house, it's very vague language. Uh, you know, consider what I would consider a street yard comparative as having a 
corner house would be more relative to a side yard. I would say also with the coding, when we're talking about 26, 31st Street, and I forgot the other one Francisco said as far as busy streets, I would debate that Forest Avenue is probably one of the busiest streets in Riverside to come in. The unique position of my house is in kind of the northeast corner, so it's not positioned in the middle. I have zero back door, so it's a side door. Um, obviously, after hearing about the site triangle and doing different things, that's why we came with the new proposal. Um, the reason why, is so then I can at least, I, I, for, I don't know which one of the trustees uh, drew up the new proposal. Trustee uh, Pollock. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so then it at least absorbs my side door, which is great. I'd like to go to the sidewalk, reason being, there's seven other properties that have that exact identical thing that do go to the sidewalk. Um, there's properties at 106 Northgate, 100 Forest Avenue that actually has a six foot privacy fence. 285 Hedrick, 478 Kent, 471 Long Common, 479 Long Common, and 180 Scottswood. All have open sight line type fences. Um, I would say the only one that doesn't is Forest Avenue that actually has a six foot privacy fence. Um, the other ones are lower with open sight lines. Although in the coding and the code book that you guys have, there's nothing that says anything about open sight line fencing. But I'm willing to obviously come here to compromise to appease what's happening. I would say in addition, um, the part of Riverside that I live is not part of the, home, the Olmstead, you know, landscaping thing as well. And considering it's a busy street, I have a four-year-old daughter, I have a dog, and I just want to try to use as much of my yard as I can. Um, and obviously, if sight lines is what you want with the open fencing, I'm more than willing to do that. And I'm not setting a new precedence, and I understand people want to preserve um, the nature and all this stuff. Um, but at the same time, there's seven other properties that are doing this. So I'm not the first that's all going to create this avalanche of things happening. because. There are certain properties that almost have identical layouts to what now this new proposal has. Um, so I'd appreciate whatever you know you come up with, um, whether it's a compromise from what we've both put in. Um, but overall, I, I would have never thought putting a fence would, I started this process in October uh, to put a fence together, where if I lived in a different town, I probably would have had this done in four, you know, probably done it today and probably been putting the fence in this weekend. So I understand the process about certain things and how it has to go through protocol. Um, but at the same time, I don't feel like I'm reinventing the wheel or all of a sudden gonna create a precedence of uh, large privacy fences everywhere. I'm trying to improve my property and make it safe for myself, my dog and my daughter. Otherwise, I'm kind of chopping my property in half, can't really absorb or use most of the property. And to be honest, if I would have known that, um, I probably wouldn't have purchased the property because most of my yard is not usable and I'm on an unbelievably busy street. Anyone that's been on Forest Avenue, wait till any train comes by, school come, school's out. The amount of traffic that's there is, is a lot. Um, so, and then reading the code is very vague about what that is and it's not clear or concise either. Um, but either way, uh, just in, in thought that there's seven other properties that have virtually what I'm asking for, I'd appreciate your uh, thought on it. Well, just to to <coughs> respond to the seven other properties issue, um, I've been on the board for nine years um, as a trustee for eight, um, and out of all those properties, uh, only one of them has come as a variation. So, you know, those, some of those have been up for for quite a while, mm -hmm. and zoning does evolve. So they could have been put up when zoning allowed them. Um, so. To use that as a as a as a um, as a reason does not make does not make the case, um, you know. Um, but that's you know that's just my my history um, for the past ten years. Um, so I I open it up to any questions from any trustees. Trustee Hannon. I, I'm 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 confused as to what we're being asked to do. The as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm missing it, um, planning and zoning was asked to approve a six foot fence. They didn't find that the materials were, or the conditions for variations were met. But now I'm hearing discussion of other proposals that did not go through planning and zoning. Do those require a variance? 
this this what he what this proposal that is on the new proposal that came over the other day or today or yesterday will still require a variance. Doesn't that have to go in front of planning and zoning again? Um, it's a new it's a new. Mr. Mars, it, it does not. So we, you're required to have a public hearing on the original proposal. Um, the findings and recommendation are before you on that proposal. You are empowered as a board at this point to deny, uh, to support the uh, findings and recommendation of the PZC, or you could grant um, the relief contrary to the PZC recommendation or any lesser relief. So these proposals are less than the original proposal, um, and you can go ahead and approve those uh, by overriding the findings and finding that uh, you know this plan, this alternative plan satisfies the standards. You could send it back to PZC for consideration if you want to, but you're certainly not obligated to. And secondly, though, to for this board to pass it, it has to pass as a supermajority. So it has to be four trustees. Correct, four trustees um, per state statute, and uh, President Ballerine does not have an opportunity to vote. So one follow-up question procedurally. Did, did, for us to grant this variance, does that mean we have to override the finding of planning and zoning on the hardship condition? I mean, it seems like we can't ignore the conditions or the, the prerequisites to grant a variance. We, we, we have to basically find, notwithstanding what planning and zoning concluded in their hearing and, and their fact finding, that there, um, there is in fact an unusual condition, uh, a particular hardship or practical difficulty um, that that you know meets meets the the ordinance requirement. I just, that's what we're being asked to do. Correct. You you still need to find that all of the variation standards have been met by the alternative plan. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you, um, Trustee Powell. Are, are we done with questions for the petitioner? Are we ready for discussion? Um, do you have anything else you'd like to add, Mr. Shannon? Okay. Um, Mr. Schumacher, are you, you good? I would like to say something. You know, John, your daughter doesn't look at you. She lives with her mother. Mr. Schumacher? What? Can't say that. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I would, I would like, you're my next door neighbor, and you're crossing the line on some personal stuff. Okay. And I, I don't even know how this is coming to forum. Okay. It's, it, it what, has. What's, what's. I'm going to be calm about what I'm what I'm about to say, and, and it's none of your business. Period. Okay, Mr. Scheinman. And above, where, and, where no, you're... above and beyond, my daughter. I am a divorced single dad, and my daughter does sleep by me and stays by me. And to sit here and and try to okay. call me out in a in a meeting of adults is very childish. Okay, where your daughter lives has no bearing well, on exactly. how we're going to decide. The fact that it's even okay. brought up at this exact moment okay. is unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, Please. unbelievable. So show Thank us you. The class, you're going to come at Please. me like that. Please, I, 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 please, I, I appreciate both of you, so please. Um, I have one question. Um, you're proposing a six-foot fence along a fence. We, we, that's, that's not, we, that's. Correct. So that, there would have to be some sort of very relief in there. Yes, so current code does not allow uh, directly abutting fences, um, either typically if there is a plan to install a new fence along a side yard, typically the neighbors will agree whose fence stays in that location. There's a single property line that divides the two properties um, by the fence existing along that shared property line um, would mean that a second fence would not be allowed to be installed on that same property line. The code requires that there's a three foot uh, setback from that property line. So by that single property line already being occupied by a fence, um, they wouldn't be allowed to add an additional fence in that location. They'd have to move three feet into, that, into their property line and a, a waiver otherwise would would need to be issued in order to relieve any of that area. Um, okay, so basically the six foot fence that you're proposing on the north end of your property could not be done uh, 
Panera codes, unless you were going to leave a three-foot barrier between it and, and have to maintain that land. Yeah. Um, so, you, so that's. I any other questions, Mr. Uh, no questions. Comment when no questions. Uh, then I will ask for a, 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 a motion to either accept or accept the findings of the planning and zoning, or I'll move to accept the findings and recommendations of the planning and zoning commission to deny the variance. That was motion made by Trustee Marsh Azaga. Um, can I have a second? I'll second. Second by Trustee Clarity. Any further discussion? Trustee Pollack. Thank you. I, I agree with the Planning and Zoning Commission completely that a uh, six foot privacy fence encroaching into a street yard is not appropriate and there's the, any unique conditions or hardships that, create, that exist on this property do not justify that type of offense. Having said that, I do think that this, there are some unique conditions to this property that create a hardship relative to compliance with the zoning ordinance. Um, you've got, it's a corner lot. There are certainly corner lots all over town, but this particular corner lot is what, what you might call a reverse corner lot where the corner side yard is on the busier street and that corner side yard and, and as a result, the rear yard is exposed to the street, a very busy street, uh, an art a street that's classified as an arterial in the, uh, in the village of Riverside. Uh, I, I believe that, you know, just because there's a hardship and a unique condition doesn't mean that we have to grant whatever's being requested. It just means that we need we should consider granting relief to the extent that the hardship justifies it. And in my opinion, um, the, the hardship is having a usable backyard that he could enclose. And in order to do that, a four foot open fence uh, encroaching five feet into that street yard, I think would address the hardship that exists here. Um, and I would be prepared to consider, and, and I, I think it would only be appropriate to send it back to Planning and Zoning Commission, but I would be prepared to have them look at, if only if the petitioner would agree to that, that specifically, uh, have the Planning and Zoning Commission look at that and, uh, and, and give us their recommendation, again, on a four-foot open fence that encloses the yard, uh, and, and encroaches only five feet into the corner street yard. Um, and, and, and that there be no other fences on the property other than a four foot open fence on the north end in the street yard lot line. Um, so I guess I would ask the petitioner if he would rather have us vote on what's before us tonight, or if he would rather go back to the Planning and Zoning Commission and have them consider uh, the four foot open fence with just a five yard encroachment, five foot encroachment. Joe. Yes, Trustee Galagos. So I, I did watch the planning and zoning meeting and I uh, agree with a lot of what they said, but the way they voted and when they voted, they did in fact seem to be very inviting for the petitioner to make revisions and come back for another look by the planning and zoning commission. I would suggest that we, as a board, say, planning and zoning, there's a new revisited uh, plan, and have them take a look at it. Thank you, Trustee Galagos. Um, Mr. Scheinman, is, is Mr. Trustee uh, Pollock's recommendation um, acceptable to you? Sure. I mean, this, this is the irony of a lot of these meetings is when I went to the first meeting with the planning and zoning board, I thought I was presenting what what I wanted and then we were gonna come up with a solution then. Now I'm coming to this meeting thinking we're gonna come up to a solution. I'm gonna kick back there to do the same thing to then come back here forward. I could see why people never wanna do a variance or do any of this stuff because this just seems like running circles. Whatever comes to a solution to make it happen. I, to be honest, this, I started this process in October. We're talking about it's, uh, what, February 17th at this point. Uh, 
Bob, you're not so, going to be digging any post holes in the next couple months. Well, anyway, I understand. So. I understand that as well. But you know, I, I'm just trying to figure out to make this happen. And every time I want to talk to somebody to try to see what we can do, now I'm getting pushed somewhere else to come back here. So I, it, whatever the process is, the, is well, this I'll is this ahead. is this is this is what Trustee Pollock has put on the table. Yeah, five foot off your house. Yeah. Um, and five foot off your garage. You, you will not be able to put a secondary fence on the north side of your property, but you will be able to enclose your yard. So you, you have a spot there that is from the back of your garage to your neighbor's fence and from the corner of your house to your neighbor's fence. You would obviously be able to enclose that. So those were the only two uh, fences that would be able, that, that long stretch would not be, would not be that long six foot stretch would not be available. Um, if you would, would, would like, I would ask for a, a, a we got multiple we, motions we have, now. We have a motion on the table so, um, and not everyone so we need to address that. So um, if that's acceptable to you and your and trustee Aberdeen's, uh, trustee Marsazga's motion fails, then that could be taken up and gone back to planning and zoning. Sure. So we're talking about four foot, what he's talking about, five foot off, four foot open fencing so I can at least have my side door. Because to be honest, the way the code's written, I would have a backyard where I can't even access it. Literally, I'd have my side door walk around to go to my backyard, which makes zero sense. The six foot fence is a separate issue because if I'm three foot off, like she says, it doesn't matter. And I, I, and I, 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 I hear you, um, but I didn't, I didn't put the door on the back on the side of your house. Mm -hmm. um, and the other, you know, the other thing you have to remember um, and is when you go all the way to the, the lot line, um, everything you said is correct. I mean, Forest is a busy street. Um, and that's, you know, it's a bike route, it's a school route. Um, and I think it's extremely important for people uh, exiting that alley, as well as you exiting your garage to have a clear sight of line up that sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, and by bringing the, the fence all the way to the sidewalk, um, does not do that. Um, so we have a um, motion on the floor in a second. So, can I ask a clarifying question? Trustee Cannon, yes. Before we vote on the motion, is one of the options uh, for the petitioner to withdraw this and go back to planning and zoning so we don't have to deal with the motion? Help me. The, the the issue there would be if he withdraws this petition, then we're starting a new public hearing. Oh, ground zero. Okay. Right. If, if like, you if okay. you just remand it, we don't necessarily need a new public hearing. They could just consider the revised proposal without republishing. Republishing. Okay. I'm just I'm just thinking through procedurally um, how to achieve Trustee Pollock's suggestion of going back to planning and zoning with the five foot proposal. Um, four foot. Four foot proposal. Um, if that's through an amendment of Trustee Marsh Osga's motion or where we go from there. So I will defer to Trustee Pollock on what he thinks the best way to. I, I think we defer to our, our legal team <laughs> on that. Um, we have questions over here from Trustee. Trust, I just please. wanted to, to add on to what uh, Trustee Hannon was saying. Um, so even if, say, um, Trustee Marsh Osga's um, motion passes, or and and or fails. I mean, or we we agree that we should not recommend a fence. So if that's what the board decides, um, that part's over. But nothing would be stopping him from starting over with planning and zoning with a new plan. So we wouldn't have to have an amendment necessarily. It would be a cost. It would be a, we'd have to go through the whole, the whole system. Uh, so if you feel that trustee Pollock's um, idea is worth to go back to planning and zoning, then you would, you would vote down trustee Marskazka's um, motion and then we would ask for a second, then, then, we'd, then we'd take up uh, trustee Pollock's motion. I'm just My, concerned about Trustee Pollock's suggestion that this would be acceptable in that uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, discussed a survey of comparable properties that they went through 
and they found the situation, they stopped counting at 24 because they didn't find the petitioner's property to be unique in any way. And so that is, I mean, you know, overwhelmingly unique. They said there are many that share the same characteristics. And it is for that reason that the variance would not be appropriate because it could be precedent setting. And, you know, it just, I think we have to be really careful. I, I completely um, empathize with, uh, you know, your situation. Um, but at the same time, it's, the code is written the way it is because we are a national landmark landscape district. And the entire uh, village pretty much falls within that, including um, the gateway to our historic downtown and central business district. And that's what Forest Avenue is. So it sets the tone as you come into town. It's what you see. Um, and that's why that, uh, well, I, know, I felt being, being in the meeting that it was just very static. It was just like, this is what I proposed, and it was black and white. If people that were in the meeting, I don't know if whoever was online here, you know, there was people that were talking about the side door aspect of it as well. But as far as what I was asking for was more, right. and obviously what they, there was no negotiating where I could have said, hey, I would try to come with, you know, a new proposal like this or what. Uh, you know, Mr. Shaman, I'm, I'm sorry, we have a motion in a second. So yeah. it, it did. Um, one thing I, I would say, say to, to Trustee Marsazga is, you know, Forest is different than other streets. Uh, it, it is, you know, 8,900 cars go down Forest. So I, I think just like when we um, allowed the, um, the fence on the North Gate, so I, I, the, the property coming off of 26, it had specific um, you know, things about that property that allowed that fence to be put up. Um, now, whether, you know, whether planning and zoning, when this goes back to them, agree with that, that's, you know, that's, that's their decision. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, if, if this board feels that at least that should be looked at because it wasn't looked at before, then, then, then that's, you know, that's what will happen if the majority of the board feel that way. So you, 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 so we have them. Go ahead, trust. Just, I, I just want to make sure I'm clear on the procedural steps here. Are, are, is it within our power to act on the modified proposal or Trustee Pollock's proposal without remanding it back to planning and zoning because it is a lesser than what was put in front of planning and zoning? Yes, it is. If that's the case, then may I ask what the purpose is in sending this gentleman back to planning and zoning if we have the power to decide that here today? Trustee Evans. I would be more comfortable putting it back through the process because I I think that we we the village has a process in place to review these matters and it's via the planning and zoning commission and I value the the commission members um, thought process and the work that they do in coming up with the with their decisions on these matters and I'm not comfortable just like having more of a loose plan tonight and just you know sort of like um, rejecting the the recommendations of the planning and zoning commission and um just saying okay come back with a you know five feet out, out of the off the house and then we'll see i mean i don't want to make any promises tonight and i also think it'd be important to follow procedure for something that's entirely different Trustee Hannon. Yeah, I, I feel like we're, we're procedurally uh, between a rock and a hard place with, with Trustee Marsh Osga's um, motion on the table because either we need to vote that up or down and then we would, could go on to vote um, to remand it back for further consideration by planning and zoning to see if this modified fence plan um, you know, addresses the multiple factors. And I, after having sat on planning and zoning, um, you know, I know they would take a good faith look at this. I don't think it's our position, or should it be, to take a look through the various factors, but the fact that the petitioner is bringing a 
new proposal, new design, uh, you know, I, I would ask uh, if, if Trustee Marsh Osgood wanted to withdraw her motion, uh, replace that with a new motion uh, pursuing Trustee Pollock's plan. And if that goes down, then Trustee Marsh Osgood can reintroduce her motion. That's Trustee nice, Evans. Nice thought, but I don't want to do that. The problem is that the re revised version of the plan isn't much different from the original version. It's, I, so the one that Francisco sent earlier, it's wasn't before the board or the commission. Yes, it's I, virtually I, the same as the original plan. As the one that was in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Yeah, I, I mean, I believe he sent a few versions sent to just did. the board that didn't go through the Planning and so, Zoning so Zoning so Commission. So the original one that went to, excuse me, Planning and Zoning um, had the fence. Um, it was a six foot fence all, it, it went up to the sidewalk um, and it covered, so I can't see from here, but it was this entire portion back here. Um, what uh, the petitioner came back with uh, a couple of weeks ago, essentially the fence starts 40 feet from the corner of Kimbark and Forest, uh, where, the side, where that side door is, um, goes from the house down to the sidewalk and then toward the rear of the property, it would be four feet and open. Um, that's what he came with a couple of weeks ago and then it um, closes off here in the garage. Um, so this one that he brought in a couple of weeks ago and Trusty Pollock's are the two that look similar. Um, whereas Trusty Pollock's goes five feet out from the house and then it goes toward the back of the, of the property. Trusty Pollock. Yeah, I, I, I want to be very clear. If, if we're voting and considering either the plan that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended denial or the plan that the petitioner submitted earlier today, that's easy. My vote is no. Um, so I don't know that we need to discuss which one is which. Uh, that's why I asked the petitioner if right. he's willing to make that, to pull it back to that five foot from the house. So, And you're only, that's five foot from the house and no other fences on the right. property other than other the connected. Than a four foot tall open fence. Open, open, open right. style fence, right. which I would recommend if this, if you're allowed to do that, that you would bring examples to planning and zoning that would be very happy, happy or very helpful of what you're planning and putting up. Um, now we can, we, can, we can vote on the motion in the second. We can ask Trustee Marsh Osgood to remove her motion or we can ask Trustee Clarity to um, Remove her second. Um, the well, effect of which would be? Would be that there wouldn't be a second and then we would take us, then we would allow Trustee Pollock to make his motion. Well, considering that the proposals on the table all go to the sidewalk and on top of the other fence, my motion will stay. I, I'll remove, I'll withdraw my second. Okay. For the, per, I, 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 I agree with you that the, What's on the table? I agree with the planning and zoning that I don't see the hardship here, but I, I like the idea of this going back to planning and zoning if we're not comfortable acting on it tonight. I don't want, I'd like to procedurally do whatever doesn't make him start from zero again and gets planning and zoning the opportunity to take a look at Trustee Pollock's proposal. Okay. Trustee Pollock, will you carefully um, <laughs> make a motion? Be, but we'll let uh, Michael Marsh I, I, first. I, I do think we, we should. We still have a motion on I the do table. think we should make sure that nobody else okay. wants to second. Do we have a second to? A second. So you're seconding Trustee Marsh Oscar's yes. motion. Okay, I'm sorry. So we have a we have a motion and a second. So Ethan, May I ask Trustee Paul or Trustee Hannon. What's the vote to carry this motion? You need to uh, this one to agree with the um, would be three findings of the Simple plan. Uh, PZC would be four. Four. But you are eligible to vote because you're not overruling them. So if we have three votes in favor of uh, accepting their recommendation, then Trustee Ballerine is able to vote. I'm sorry, President and Ballerine. What would the effect of abstentions be? Uh, abstentions, it, in this case, would go with the majority. And the, to be clear, the motion on the table is to, to agree with planning and zoning and deny the petitioner's request. Altogether, yes. Forcing right. him then to start from zero with a new public hearing. Correct. But if we reject the motion on the table, does that allow us 
to Does someone could propose a new motion that will allow it to go back to planning and zoning? Correct. And in rejecting that motion, are we disagreeing with the findings of the Planning and Zoning Commission? It, not if no. your expressed reasoning, like we've talked about here, is to send an alternative plan back. I don't think it's... Understood. Thank you. Okay. Ethan, would you please call the roll? Trustee Powell. No. Trustee Aberdeen Marshazga. Aye. Trustee Pollock, or Trustee Hannon. Uh, disagree with the motion, so that's a no. Okay, no. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. No. Trustee Galgos. No. Okay, motion okay. fails. Um, I forgot Alex was there, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, Alex. <laughs> um, Trustee Pollock, please. Thank you. I, uh, I move that we uh, remand this petition to the Planning and Zoning Commission with the specific direction uh, to consider only a uh, variation that would allow a five-foot encroachment into the corner side street yard with that being a four-foot open fence and uh, and that uh, there'd be no other fence, privacy fences, and the only other fencing would be the, uh, as President Ballerine described, to enclose the uh, north side. Um, and also with, before the Planning and Zoning Commission considers it, I would like the petitioner to provide a elevation of the fence that's actually being proposed to, so we can be sure it meets the standard we expect. Do you want to specify what you mean by open? Typically, open fences are defined as being 50% open. Uh, the standard I've seen most often is that for every one foot of lineal horizontal length of the fence, that 50% of that is open, meaning you could have three inch boards and three inch openings or two and two, okay. basically. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Uh, would, would you consider, instead of fencing, uh, having it be uh, shrubs or landscaping material well sure if the petitioner wanted to do that they could do that it's my understanding they could uh I mean, if he wanted to just withdraw this petition and do landscaping that's his prerogative um, there, there there is a prohibition on landscape hedges mm -hmm. and street yards similar to this it's in our code so it would have to go and, and, and zoning i'm zoning. sorry if yes. i seem flippant but and that's enforced rigorously in the board. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a motion from Trustee Pollock. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Second by Trustee Hannon. Ethan, if you would please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshazga. No. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. No. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Galgos. Aye. Okay. Um, and then. Uh, Go ahead. It, it's important that we specify at what meeting this will be heard. Um, can we put it on the agenda for the special meeting on the 28th? We do still have the ability to mm -hmm. add to that agenda. Okay. Can the petitioner be, is the 28th acceptable to you? Uh, this month or next month or when are you talking about? February 28th. February 28th. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, we can. Yeah, make, I could, what date does that fall on? Monday. Monday. But we just need to make sure to keep the to ensure that we yeah. don't need to republish that we it would specify be at, what, the same date. time, 7 p.m.? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, we're good. Okay. okay. So this matter will be heard by PZC on the February 28th at 7 p.m. Yes, Trustee Pollock. I, I just wanted to, to, to make one other comment. Uh, the petitioner described the process as being extremely difficult, and I'm sympathetic to that. But on the other hand, zoning variations should be difficult. Yes, they should. <laughs> Uh, no one has to go through a zoning variation process. They always have the choice of simply complying. So it's, it's to a degree it's intended to be difficult because we don't want to encourage a lot of zoning variation. So just wanted to p point that out. So I'm clear on this. I come the 28th with the proposal you're, you put in place to talk to them to then come back to a future meeting probably one month from around now to talk to you guys, well, our, deja our vu. Our next meeting would, our following meeting after that would be the first, March 3rd? First, 3rd. yeah, March 3rd. Ooh. We turned it around that fast. 
Yeah, yeah, but again, you're not going to be digging post holes in March, so. I would say. Yes, trustee. So you would come back with um, a P and Z recommendation. Correct, and then we would vote on it probably March the Seven. second meeting in March. Seven. Okay. Okay. Uh, sounds good. You understand everything? I do. Thank you for your time, Francisco. You good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you. Next thing on a, uh, is a resolution approving a hardscape permit application for the installation of a carriage walk to be located at 310 Maplewood Road. Uh, Director Tab. All right. Uh, Matthew and Lauren Dorsky of 310 Maplewood Road have submitted a hardscape permit application for the installation of a carriage walk in front of the residence. Again, at 310 Maplewood Road. In your packet, you will notice a map of the location. The installation as outlined in the Gorsi's letter, which is also included in the packet, will allow access to the house for relatives that park on Maplewood Road. The property does not have a driveway access for Maplewood Road. The garage is accessed from 31st Street, as seen in the attached overview. The carriage walk will be located on the public right-of-way. However, it is considered an extension of the private walk due to the lack of curb cut which would be required for a public use sidewalk. The carriage walk being an extension of the private walk requires the homeowner to repair or remove the walkway should it fall into disrepair. This requirement is memorialized in the right-of-way encroachment letter that's filled out and filed with the county during the permitting process. Of course, with all um, sidewalk, we do require the exposed aggregate finish, and that will, um, as Again, all sidewalk installations go through the permitting process with the building department. The hardscape permit application process requires the Landscape Advisor Commission and the Preservation Commission review, comment, and make a recommendation on the application prior to the application bring, being presented to the board uh, tonight. The Preservation and LAC uh, have both reviewed and recommended the approval of the proposed hardscape permit application um, with the following comments, and I'll just quickly over, get an overview. The uh, Preservation Commission uh, moves to approve the hardscape permit application as it would not affect the village's landmark designation. And the LEC uh, made a motion to approve the hardscape permit application, the Board of Trustees consideration with the stipulations that the parkway tree roots are pruned during construction and that tree protection is implemented prior to the construction as is mandated under mandate until construction is finished. The LAC would further note that they have reservations as the proximity of the carriage walk to the parkway manhole cover, the parkway tree, and the street drainage depression. Um, but they did approve it as well. So if there's any questions regarding that hardscape, um, I can answer any, those. Any, any questions from the trustees? Okay, I think it's it's important to note that uh, the the other houses that are next to it, 300, 304, both have the carriage walk, and it's a very unique property in the fact that they, their garage is accessed from um, 31st Street, so there is no driveway. Um, so I, I we we kind of discussed, um, Trustee Pollock discussed uh, about something like this. Um, Doug, do you want to? Well, I was going to wait till see if, assuming if this gets approved by the board, and then I was going to follow up and suggest we send it to LAC to review our regulations regarding this type of improvement. Okay, so then I will ask for a motion to approve or motion. deny. Motion to approve by Trustee Evans. Second. Second. Second by Trustee Marsh Osga. Ethan, if you'd please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marsh Osga. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Motion carries. Trustee Pollock. Yes, I would like to ask the board if they would be interested in sending or directing the Landscape Advisory Commission, and I guess preservation would need to look at it as well, to look at our regulations about a, an improvement like this. Um, Whenever I see something like this go through the process and it, like everyone's like, yeah, that's fine. What, then I always ask, well, why did we make them go through the process? And should we look at our regulations to figure out how we can craft them so that these situations don't have to go through the process, yet we don't open up, you know, 
can of worms. Can of worms and, and allow something we don't want. So I would, uh, unless there's disagreement, I, I would like to, to see if there's consensus to, to direct that to the uh, planning or landscape advisory and preservation commissions. Because this is truly a unique situation. I mean, there's very, very few homes in town that, that don't have a driveway because uh, most of the homes are accessed from the, the front street. So it's very unique. So is there a consensus that we, we take a look at this down at, uh, through LAC and preservation? Seeing shakings of three heads. Alex, can you shake your head for me? Thank you. Okay, um, consensus. Um, so if you can do that, that'd be great. It, it, can I ask, is it a general review of the regulations or just creating an exception for putting in carriage walks without having to go through the process in the event that you don't have one? The latter. It's okay. more of the latter. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe it's a bad idea. Maybe we need to keep maybe, you know, the unintended consequences of allowing it by right are too great and maybe landscape advisory and preservation will say no let's keep it the way it is and that's fine but it's worth looking but at. your 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 thought is not to allow everybody to have this right. only people that have this type of situation where right. this unique situation where they don't have a driveway in the front right okay so if i may yes you may you're, thank you um so we're looking at creating a set of standards where it could potentially be an administrative review similar to what we do currently and maybe it's somewhat incorporated to application process that we do for when uh, residents apply to do uh, right-of-way planting right. essentially yeah, that okay. sounds right yeah. okay so there's a consensus on that okay new business uh, a resolution authorizing the village manager to execute a sales agreement and issue a purchase order with foster coach sales incorporated for the purchase of a 2022 Horton ambulance for the amount not to exceed three hundred thousand four hundred and ten dollars director Buckley so back during the capital improvement uh, planning process for fiscal year 2022 uh, we discussed the replacement of the 2003 ambulance um, and staff incorporated that capital purchase <coughs> into the fiscal year 2022 budget the reason why we did this was because we did receive funding uh, funding source for this through the ARPA funds, which is the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, so after we were notified of that, we developed specifications for the replacement of the ambulance. Foster Coach Sales uh, provided the low bid, uh, which is through the state purchasing plan through the suburban purchasing cooper cooperative bidding process. Um, the average life expectancy of an ambulance is between eight and 10 years. Uh, so this ambulance has definitely outlived its service life. Um, over the past two years, this ambulance has served as our COVID response ambulance. We had it set up um, where if we did have a COVID uh, patient, we would transport that patient to the hospital in this ambulance. And what that meant is we removed a lot of equipment from the back of it. We sealed up a lot of the areas uh, to isolate the back patient compartment area. Um, so we would be able to uh, transport somebody appropriately to the hospital. So this ambulance did start getting used a lot more over the past couple of years, and as such, it has started showing a lot more wear uh, to the vehicle and a lot more rust and maintenance to the vehicle. Part of this uh, process also that's been, um, that we've received with the proposal is the power cot uh, stretcher and the power cot load system. Um, this is a patient loading and lo unloading system that we have uh, for the back of the ambulance. You know, it seems like a lot of money for that piece of equipment, uh, which it is, but it saves, uh, if we had one back injury as a result of loading a patient in the ambulance, uh, this system pays for itself as far as I'm concerned. It really, I wasn't a big fan of them when they first came out and I've really changed my opinion since we do have one on our current ambulance um, and it, it has done its job uh, through the years, so. We recommend at this time that uh, the village board um, approves a motion uh, for this resolution authorizing the village manager to ex execute the sales agreement and issue a purchase order with Foster Coach Sales for the purchase of a 2022 Horton Ambulance for an amount not to exceed the $300,410. I will say our previous ambulance that we purchased uh, almost six years ago now, uh, that ambulance 
was purchased for around $280,000, so the price has gone up. Uh, the manufacturer and our dealer have advised us that it's about a 12 to 14 month delivery date, so we won't see it till mid next year. Um, and there is gonna be a price increase in the next few months of 9% also. So um, I think due to the ARPA funds, having the funding for this ambulance plus price increase coming very uh, shortly, uh, which is why we, re we recommend moving forward with this proposal. Um, being a, a person that got to ride in the back of that ambulance on that stretcher, it was, uh, it was very seamless to get in and out. So, um, you know, a, a couple of things that when the, the, we talked about the last ambulance six years ago that I didn't realize is, you know, when it, each ambulance has to be um, certified to enter the hospital. So if you have a, a, an ambulance that's not certified, um, and our, our main ambulance goes down and, and, and the second ambulance is not certified, then we rely on our mutual aid. Um, and, and that's always not going to be as, as quick and as, as, as fast as we would like. Um, and secondly, I think if you take a look at the breakdown of the major incidences for the first quarter this year, um, rescue and emergency services with that ambulance are you know 49 percent 56 percent 44 percent so it's our most it's our most used uh, piece of equipment and you know uh, one, one thing i did forget to add about it and president ballerine you know you were in the back of that ambulance once um <laughs> unfortunately but that ambulance is a mobile emer emergency room our paramedics are trained to a very high level and that's what we consider this this is an actual emergency room on wheels although it's much more compacted it's in a, a small area but initial patient treatment that's where it all starts so it's a very important piece of equipment for us thank you any questions from the trustees hearing none if i can have a motion motion, made. motion by trustee gallagos uh second i'll second second by trustee marshazga ethan if you'd please call the roll trustee pollock aye trustee marshazga aye Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, D, resolution approving and authorizing the exec execution of an independent contractor agreement for plan review and building inspection services with TPI Building Code Consultants Incorporated and authorizing the village manager to issue a purchase order or orders regarding the same in the amount not to exceed $135,000 annually. Ms. Monroe. Hello, thank you. Uh, good evening. I am very pleased after several months of work uh, to present the opportunity to, to enter into this agreement with TPI. Um, we did reorganization of the community development department this in this past year, and in doing so, after the retirement of our longtime building inspector, uh, and a few others leaving, we determined that we would continue to search for a building inspector, plan reviewer on our village staff. Um, we have made several attempts to do so and uh, failing to bring anyone on as a village employee, uh, the next best step is to use a service that provides building plan review and inspection services. Um, it's extremely common throughout the, the region to use a service like this. Um, the services that we've been having provided for the past year didn't have a formal agreement in place. And so uh, in being you know, good, good stewards and responsible for the village's operations, we uh, went out for a request for proposals. We got several. Uh, that we reviewed as a staff team. Uh, we interviewed four different firms and selected uh, TPI as the best fit for the village, um, both in uh, you know general cost of services and the flexibility and uh, quality of services that they're able to provide to us. So this agreement is, um, I, I did note a a correction I'll make to my memo, which says this is a one-year agreement. Um, the, the actual agreement is a two-year agreement that would be able to be extended in one-year increments two times. So essentially four years. 
Um, what we'll do with TPI is until the point in time where we may be able to bring on our own village staff, either in part-time capacity or full-time capacity, um, they would provide those services for us. We'll have someone um, on site a couple of days a week uh, in the office to act as a plan reviewer and someone to consult for residents, contractors. Um, we get calls frequently and it pulls staff away from um, other things that they're not technically trained, you know, to try and answer some of those questions. And this will this will provide a good resource for us. Uh, the other part of the time, they'll be doing um, on-site property inspections, so building inspections for um, mechanical, plumbing, building, and then uh, as a backup, electrical. We do have a, a current part-time contracted electrical inspector. Um, they'll be able to assist with property maintenance inspections as well. And as I said, the, the goal is always to first try to look for village staff, um, and this firm TPI will fill in the gaps. So as long as we don't have anyone on staff, they would provide those services to us. And if we are able to hire someone, then we're able to even through this agreement, uh, modify the level of services provided. So they would just, again, be the reserve uh, firm to do both commercial you know, plan review, which we've always, you know, generally always contracted out. Um, and then anything, if somebody's on vacation, they're unable to make an inspection, we can call on them and uh, they'll, as I said, perform those duties for us. So I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Okay. Trustees, any questions for Ms. Monroe? I just, I, just for clarity, we're, we're $135,000 annually. These, this is a basically a pass-through. I mean, this is billed through building permits and things like that. So it's Correct. not like we're just spending $135,000. Correct. So uh, a good portion of this, you know, we budgeted. Um, where, where did I find where we budgeted? Um, last year, you know, we've incurred, you know, well over that in expenses for the building plan review, inspection services, things that we have contracted out. Um, it was an exceptionally um, busy year, not always typical. And so we felt that um, by setting the amount at 135,000, that it would you know, remove or hopefully remove the possibility that we would have to come back to you for any, any type of increase. But to answer your question, President Ballerine, um, yes, the majority of building permits uh, covers these expenses. So what we charge in building plan review fees, uh, in the building permits, uh, we do pass through the cost of inspections and any other reinspections, those sorts of things do get passed um, through to the applicants that are, that are getting those permits. So, it's, it's revenue in that we would then provide as the expenditure okay. on this. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Thank Any you. questions, trustees? Hearing none, if I can have a motion and a second, please. I'll make a motion. Motion by tr Trustee Evans, second by Trustee Galagos. Uh, Ethan, if you would please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshazka. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, e, a resolution amending the Village of Riverside Park Bench Policy, Park Bench Donation Policy. Director Tab. Thank you. Um, so this policy came in front of the board not too long ago, uh, 2018, but since then, due to the price increases, uh, here we are again. So. Uh, staff has recommended to amend the language in the village's park bench donation policy to accommodate the rapid rise in costs observed throughout the supply chain. The original version of the policy charged a flat $2,500 fee for the installation of a new bench or for the replacement of existing bench that had not been previously commemorated. This $2,500 fee can cover the price of the bench, the installation supplies, the labor required to pour the mounting pad, assemble the bench, and install it. In the last year, material costs alone have proven to meet and at times exceed the original $2,500 fee. The amended policy will provide a real-time cost estimate that can be provided to the donor when the application is submitted. 
The new fee structure will also include a 2.5% administrative fee that will cover a portion of staff's time spent processing the paperwork that is required to be submitted to the commissions and board for approval prior to the installation of a bench. This format will allow the policy to stay relevant moving forward regardless of uh, material and labor costs. And by and what I mean by that is if somebody submits an application for a park bench, we will call the vendor, we'll get the, the, at that time price because they're always fluctuating, and then we will estimate our supply costs and labor expenses, and that will be the price that's presented to the applicant as opposed to doing a flat fee. So it's a real-time uh, cost estimate. The additional amendments to the policy include removing language referencing the creation of a maintenance fund and removing the option of a plaque-only donation. The maintenance fund never came to fruition as a result of the escalating cost of materials. Staff has determined that any maintenance costs on the older benches can be absorbed in the annual operating budget, and that's basically the wooden benches, the wooden concrete benches. Occasionally, we'll have to replace a wood plank, but it's at minimal cost. The plaque-only donation option was never entertained by a donor, and ultimately, the goal is to replace the entire bench as opposed to installing uh, a, new a new plaque on an old bench. So we're just hitting some points that um, were never entertained by donors, and then uh, basically the, the cost escalation over the, the couple of years. So if anyone has any questions on that, we have to answer them. Any questions from trustees? You know, I I don't have a question, but I would make a recommend make a, a recommendation. Um, before before us today was the Olmstead Overlook. Um, and they're putting a bench in. Um, the Olmstead is, is, you know, I don't think that this would fall under the, a bench donation policy because of the work they do in our village. So at the very least, I would like us to consider um, waiving the 2.5% administration fee for that bench. If the board sees fit, we can do that. I'm sure it would be greatly appreciated. Okay. So do we need a... We don't need a vote on that, right? We just, just to... Okay, okay. Okay, uh, so we'll, um, with that being said, if we can have a motion to accept the bench policy. Motion made. Motion by Trustee Gallego, second. Second. Second by Trustee Marshazka. Ethan, if you'd please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshazka. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. And just to be clear, we do have a consensus that we would waive the 2.5% for the Olmstead bench. Seeing nods all across. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Last item, um, lead service line replacement discussion. Trustee Tapp. All right. Um, so this is, a, this is a very thorough document, and I feel the need to summarize it, so this is going to be a little lengthy. But as I read through this and the points that are contained in the Act, um, I have the village engineer, Ryan Gailey, here, and, of course, Michael Mars for any kind of legal questions that may uh, pique your interest as I, I, I go through this. Uh, effective January 1st, 2022, the Lead Service Line Replacement and Notification Act became law in Illinois. The act determined that for the health and safety of the citizens of Illinois, all lead service lines must be replaced by the owner or operator of, a, of any community water supply, uh, i.e. the Village of Riverside. Beginning in 2022, the Village of Riverside will be required to create an inventory containing the number, the total number of service lines located within the village and the material of each line. This inventory is required to be initially submitted to the Illinois uh, Environmental Protection Agency, IEPA, in 2022, excuse me, 2023, and is required to be completed by April 15th, 2024. Staff will be taking the opportunity to gather data for the service line material inventory during the upcoming meter exchange program, which will begin late spring 2022 this year. Once the service line inventory has been completed, a lead service line replacement plan is required to be drafted. This plan will identify the course of action each water supplier will take to replace all the lead service lines within, it, within its service area. 
The initial phase of the replacement plan is required to be submitted by early 2024 with the final version due 2027. Once the lead service line replacement plan has been submitted and approved by the IEPA, Riverside will have 17 years at a rate of no less than 6% per year to replace all lead service lines within the village. As a condition of the act, the village is required to provide 45 days advance notice when it initiates a water main replacement project. This notice is requesting access to the property and permission to replace the lead service line within the home. If no response is received within 15 days of the initial request, the village shall attempt to post the request on the entrance to the building. If a property owner ultimately refuses to allow access to the property for a lead service line replacement, the owner will be requested to sign a waiver provided, provided by the IEP, excuse me, the IDPH or the Illinois Department of Public Health. If the property owner refuses to sign a waiver, IDPH will be notified by the village. If a property owner initiates a repair or placement of lead service line themselves, then the property owner is required to provide a 45 day notice to the village. Uh, that is often uh, standard through the permitting process where we, we usually know well in advance. If the circumstance arose where the property owner were to do a partial repair or replace their portion of the lead service line, <clears throat> the village is required to replace the remainder of the lead service line within 30 days or up to 120 days if necessary due to weather conditions. Um, basically if the ground's frozen or covered in snow and so forth. In the event that a partial emergency repair of a lead service line is required by the village, the property owner and all occupants will be notified of the completed repair and be provided with a point of use filter by the village. The remainder of the lead service line must be replaced within 30 days of the emergency repair or again up to 120 days if necessary due to weather. When it comes to funding these projects, the community water suppliers are responsible to cover the cost created by the lead service line replace, replacement projects unless state or federal funding is available. A community water supplier expending its own funds can require the owner of the private portion of the lead service line to cover that cost. The Lead Service Line Replacement and Notification Act does allow for both home rule and non-home rule municipalities to fund lead service line replacement by ordinance or resolution under specific taxing statutes. I know that's a lot. Um, so before I get to the board, um, so we do have a couple of requests uh, for board direction. Are there any questions regarding what I just read? Do we have any idea? Is there, was lead used predominantly in the, when? I mean, did, do we know how many were, were, I mean, is it 1950s, 1960s, 1920s? I mean. It was regulated, um, you could not use it after 1986. But 1986? Yeah, up till then it was used, and I believe the estimate in Illinois alone is 600,000 services. Please go ahead. Um, we have an annual water monitoring of uh, the different levels of we do. Uh, chemicals in, in our water supply. Uh, lead has never jumped out as a particular. Right. Level. So every three years we do a lead and copper sampling. And um, you're right. We, we monitor it. We've never had an issue. And that one of the reasons we don't have the issue is because the city of Chicago introduces phosphates in the water and it coats the inside of the lead service lines. So the water does not directly contact the lead unless they happen to be disturbed. Um, and that's where the, the homeowner would have a point repair, the whole service line has to get replaced as of January 1st of this year. Or if we do a repair on our portion of the lead service line, the entirety of that lead service line into the home has to be re replaced. So are, are, can our residents be confident that currently we don't have any? Nothing's changed. We still, we. You know, the service lines as they stand are safe. And the mandate to replace the service lines over the next 17 years, um, would this create a disruption that might cause issues for homeowners? I just want to be aware of what's happening in our village. Well, the, so starting 20, 2024, that's when the 17 year period begins. Okay. Okay, so we, we saw a little right. bit more of that. 2027. 2027. <laughs> That's why you're sitting here. Um, but until that point comes where we knock on your door and says it's time to replace your lead service, there's no 
there's no issues. Uh, we still are testing every three years with lead and copper sampling. City of Chicago still treats the water to prevent you know, any lead issues or leaching into the water. So nothing's changed. This is a act that was approved by the state of Illinois to start the process. And once the lead pipe replacement process begins, is that going to trigger um, a situation for homeowners where if they do not replace additional lines, then there will be displacement and a potential um, health issue? Uh, this is what I'm trying to... Right, the replacing of the lead service line with copper right. from the main to the meter inside or within 18 inches of inside the home. Um, that takes the lead service line out of the equation. Now, um, solder in lead or in copper pipes and in fixtures, you know, certain fixtures do have a lead content to them. That is, you know, on the private side, that's within the, the home itself. Um, so I'm not saying if you were to test the water, you're going to get a, a finite or really small amount of lead that may be attributed to your piping in your home or your fixtures. But by us replacing your lead service line, that is taking the source of the water. Um, you know, it's going to be copper, and you won't have that component in your plumbing system anymore. Did that answer your question? It somewhat does. I just, you know, if lead isn't an issue until a pipe is disrupted or displaced and we're having a lead pipe replacement program, I just wanted to understand whether or not that would create any additional potential health risk to homeowners that they would have to incur additional costs beyond, um, you know, I mean, to address things within the interior of their home or on those fittings or fixtures because of the replacement process? No. So if we were to replace your service line with copper, the whether it's the solder on your pipes or it's the, the lead content in your fixture unit, none of that's going to be exacerbated by us replacing your line. Okay. That yeah. answers the question. Thank you. Okay. That will still be in your, in your plumbing system within your home. It's not going to get any better or worse. Right, it'll right. But it's not present. going to exacerbate it. Right. Okay, how, thank you. Right. How does this dovetail with the meter replacement? Because we're going to be... Good timing. Yeah. The um, lead service line inventory, we are using the meter replacement program, program as an opportunity to get in everyone's home and fill out our inventory, which is required by the IEPA. So we have till April 15, 2024 to get that submitted. And anyone that, obviously our meter replacement program is three years, so for those homes that we will not get to in that time period, we'll have to make specific appointments to get in the homes if we don't have the information currently. For the last couple of years through uh, compliances, every time a home changes hands and we do a final water read, we get in there and we make note of the lead service, or the service line material. So we have approximately 20% of the town on record, but it's the other 80% that we have to we have to get. Are we going to position our meter, our water meter replacement program around that 80% first? Currently, the way the water meter replacement program is being designed is to work from our most problematic area of town, which is the south of the tracks and work our way north. And when I say pro problematic, that is we, every month we read the meters and we have a list of issue meters that we have. It could be, I think the average is like 60 that we have to physically go to and either get in the home or we have to take a manual read off of that. So we're trying to weed those out of the system by replacing those, meter, those meters first. So it, it frees up staff's time to do other things because Right now they spend two or three days um, chasing down meters that did not read every month. So the south side of town has the most problems. We're, the intent is to start there and phase our way north. Um, okay. There is, and we'll get to that, there's funding that is available and we are working on creating a plan for this that is required for the funding. 
Um, we are trying, as you can imagine, it's a very involved process to time replacements of services that may or may not be connected to newer or older mains under newer streets or older streets in conjunction with the main itself being old and streets that may have been repaired recently. So it's weaving a bunch of variables to formulate a plan that is as cost effective and efficient within this timeline. And of course, the funding source has to be there as well. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, Trustee Evans? Um, so you said we, we would be starting on the south side because that's where the most problems uh, that's are. That's with the meter exchange program. Oh. Correct. Okay. The lead service well, line, um, we're still working on the timing of where we would, you know, working um, throughout town. What we're trying to do is we're trying to group it with uh, pre-existing projects for economy of scale. If we have the contractors in the area and we're digging up a street, we want to make sure we're not going to do it twice. Um, so all these, and it, it's strictly depending on funding. If we're not able to obtain any funding, which it sounds, you know, we feel good about, then our plans can have to get reorganized. Mm -hmm. So, so what, go ahead. I'm sorry. So the first thing people want to know is when when to expect that the village will be replacing the pipes in their yard right right now we are doing a application for funding that would be available in 2023 okay. so the earliest that we'll have the funding available to do it in mass quantities which we're estimating depending on prices at the time between 450 and 500 services a year assuming the funding's in place it's a lot um, but until then and I'll bring it up <clears throat> in my uh, board direction questions, there is required to be a stopgap source of funding because as of the day we sit here today, until we get this funding in place, if Public Works were to come across a service line leak that has to get replaced, the entirety of the service has to get replaced. There's no partial replacements. So um, at the going rate of $7,500 per service on average to replace them, we need to have the funding available. Mm -hmm. So I'll allude to that when I when I pose one of my board direction questions. Okay, yes. Yeah, so we would start in 2023. And so how, how does it work? It, so if you if we say, okay, we're going to start on this street, you know, in spring 2023, then the residents will know that in, in spring of 2023, they're going to have to pay $7,500? Like, is, this, is it as soon as you do their yard, they have to do their part? So, no, there's there's options, right? Um, if funding is secured, the assumption would be there would be no cost to the residents if, if funding's secured, right? Mm -hmm. um, if funding is not secured and a lead service line has to be replaced, the village has the option to charge the homeowner for their portion of the lead service line, which is from the, the bee box or the water shutoff valve on the parkway to the home. Mm -hmm. Then the village would cover the cost of their uh, responsibility, which is the bee box to the main. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so it'd be a fraction or whatever the proportion will share of that estimated $7,500 is. But that's if funding has not been secured. That's kind of how that would progress, assuming the board wants to charge the homeowner. So if, so if 70, some, yeah, some sorry, sorry, I have more questions. So Very it's seventy five hundred dollars for the village section and that's in total. That's the, the homeowner. complete okay. service. So it would be like if we had to if we had to have the residents pay it would be the proportional share would be dictated by the length from the shutoff valve in the in the parkway to where it enters the home. So for instance, a home on Quincy or Burlington, very short setbacks from the main itself. You go into the first division where a home might have a hundred foot setback. Mm -hmm. So the proportional share is gonna, it's gonna be like a sliding type, of, you know, assignment of cost. Okay, thanks. If a main breaks today mm -hmm. and you dig up the front yard and find out it's a lead service line. Has to be replaced. Has to be replaced. Right. So even with funding or no funding in place, we need to figure out what has to be done with that. Or we it, can- It has to be replaced. 
then we'll have to figure out how we pay for it. And what about uh, ongoing, like the work we're doing on the Olmstead that we, the sewer and water main and all that, well, those, th that's gonna come up in two years. Sure, the way we're kind of putting this plan together is that work, when we're there, we're going to do all those services in conjunction with that project. The project that is proposed for 2023 on Shenstone, that's a complete water main replacement. Those services will be done during that project. So the question is whether we want to charge those residents on Shenstone and Homestead and coming as for the fee, or we, Best I mean, case scenario, we get funding for it from yeah. the EPA. Isn't it, isn't it, shouldn't we, before we make decisions on how, who we're gonna charge and how we're gonna charge, shouldn't we have the, the funding piece answered first? So there, there has to be, you know, as we sit here, if we have an issue tomorrow, that has to be addressed. The funding source, best case scenario, begins 2023. But we have a year or more until we receive that funding. And if an issue arises where we have to hire a plumber to replace the lead service line, no, we have to and that will really be the case in perpetuity because if we are <coughs> able to get funding, we have to, as part of that funding process, recognize the areas and the services sure. that we're and doing. That, so that's if kind you of get an emergency repair, yeah. you're still going to have to locally fund that. Right. What, what, is, what is the chance of funding? I'm sorry. What, I mean, do we, is, this, there's, is there ample amount of money out there? Is this Yes, so the, the IEPA has a, a program in that's in the process now where you can get up to $4 million of forgivable loans for lead service line replacement on an annual basis. So um, we're in the process of putting that application together right now. Okay, thank you. Trustee, pa Trustee Hannon, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, the second time we've done that. The, uh, I, I, I sort of share your, your, your view that the threshold question is uh, you know, obviously submit an application to the IEPA to understand what the funding is um, and then make a decision on who pays. And in the interim, um, you know, I think it's very difficult for 2022 projects, you know, to, to put a burden on, on the homeowners, you know, for that interim period. Um, you know, my question would be, do, you know, there, there was some funding available, as I understand it, from uh, various funds that came through um, COVID relief measures. I don't know if I'm calling that, but there, there's, uh, I, I just uh, hate to have the 2023 projects funded through this IEPA program and people who have an emergency in 2022 get stuck with a big bill. That, that just doesn't sit well with me. I, I agree. That's where I was kind of trying to circle around at. Um, now, did you say there is money available right now? $4 million? The earliest you can receive that is in 2023. Okay. And how many homes do we have? I mean, if we, we had have, to replace everyone. We have approximately 3,000 services. 3,000 times. You're looking at roughly $30 million. Okay, thank you. So if, if there's no other questions, I'll hit my bullet points here Please. and that might help answer some of the questions. Uh, so staff is requesting board direction on the following items. Uh, number one being does the board, I think I know the answer to this, but does the board want staff in conjunction with the village engineer to submit applications through the IPA for possible funding for lead service line replacement? Yes. That's an assumed yes, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> that was all, the easy one. We're all on the same page on that one. We just stop on that. We've yeah. <laughs> Uh, the second one is, if a funding source is not secured, kind of like we alluded to, does the board want the property owner to pay for their portion of the lead service line replacement? And if yes, uh, is this to be paid back over a period of time? And again, the estimated cost is $7,500 for a complete service line replacement. But it does sound like grant funding will be secured eventually. So you have a couple of different scenarios, right? So you have when you get grant funding and you, you make a plan to go replace service lines, or if you're replacing your, your water main and you're doing the service lines, um, there should be funding available for both of those scenarios. But then you also have the emergency repair scenario or someone looking to 
um, change out their service line just because they want to get ahead of it and change it out, or if they're doing a remodel, things of that nature. I think that's really where you're looking for the direction, right? That or if you don't get the funding. Right, so if somebody comes to um, Ashley with a, a leak on their service line and ultimately the whole thing has to be replaced, who's gonna pay for that? Well, like, Obviously the village will pay for their portion, right. right? But the other three quarters of it, just until we get funding, of course. Right. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with Trustee Hannon on that, that if we're gonna try to fund this, it's not necessary fair to hit the people that have the early problems with the with the price and, and, and then the guy down the street gets it for, for nothing. Um, are you, do you, sorry. Go ahead, please. My finance hat's going on right now. Um, could we create some, and I would have to talk with Director John, so it may be us doing some analysis of, you know, looking at the projects that we already have in the queue with estimated funding that we're looking at, and then from an equity standpoint of anybody this year and moving forward, their lead service line, kind of creating, looking at where our financials are projecting out, because remember we made a change to how we were Collecting. doing the infrastructure fee for it to be more equitable for <coughs> power users of our system. And so being conservative, we were very conservative in those projections and seeing how that those numbers were going to play out. What the board could do is see we could start projecting as we go along and saying this is something that's going to be funded by the water and sewer fund recognizing that we'll get some hopefully some funding through epa loans but that we may have to tweak up our water rates to have to pay for these lead service lines but i think that becomes more palatable of paying a little bit more monthly versus having to pay $7,500 to have your entire line be replaced. Here's the challenge though, is that we, we do have properties that have, have replaced their lines. And so from an equity standpoint, sorry, I've, I've given you a solution and a problem at the same time. This is what happens when I talk things through. Oh, could we have something where we um, allow people who have purchased or replaced service lines within the last X years to apply for a rebate once we get the money? Because we don't know that we're going to get any money at all. Yeah. But um, could we, you know, so once I money is received, could we send notices to these people who have paid? Previously, Trustee Mars or uh, Trustee Mars. Sorry, <laughs> Bernie Mars. <laughs> I, I, I would strongly suspect that the conditions on the loan money would not allow you to give it to people who had voluntarily or right. right. some prior to that. But in the same vein, could it be that we we have people provide that information? If we do a look back at the past ten years, or people that have switched out their lead service with the appropriate types of lines and it's because it's the water sewer fund so obviously the new money that we're getting in goes to those projects and we account for it as such but this other piece for the infrastructure fee could there potentially be a credit recognized I'd have to do a little bit more due diligence on this um, but I, I think there there could be a way to, to look at giving the benefit to those that have invested in that, if that's the board's direction of what they want to do, but recognizing that we're probably still going to have to do some adjustment to that rate moving forward um, because the, the EPA loans aren't gonna cover all of it. Trustee Pollock, did you? Right. Well, I, I, I wanna clarify something we have, um, up until now in our current policy is that if there's a water main break in front of your house and you see a lead service line, 
that homeowner's required to replace it, correct? No. No. So what 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 did I think was there something else? So so right now we we we've we've we never require someone to replace a lamp? No. Okay. I, I misunderstood. As something. of January first, if we have a water main break and we visualize a lead service line that kick starts the process of replacement. Just that's a if, new policy started that started January 1st. Yep. But before that, state law required. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, this is a, a state law enacting. Have we had any? No. Okay. So that's why I was trying to figure out have, have people been doing this already and paying for it themselves and now we're going to change that. On average. It sounds like no. So on average, um, I'm not completely sure on the, the building portion of it, but we come across three to six service line leaks a year that we're aware of. So we're not talking about huge numbers. It's those folks that go through the permitting process to do something that um, the water department or public works may not be aware of. And I'm not sure how many of those occur, but you know, if they start that process, then the entirety has, of the line has to be replaced. Trustee Hannon. And, yeah. and, and that's a distinction I'd like to pursue. You know, we have the emergency situation, or as you said, a leak where now we have to go and replace the whole thing. I think that's one category of people, they shouldn't get dinged uh, for this cost. I think the other category is someone voluntarily going through this problem. Like they're just hell bent on replacing their system then they're going to take the lead pipes out and because of that you have to do other things you know i'd like to have a make sure that whatever policy we adopt we differentiate between those two people people in an emergency situation and people voluntarily acting that causes right. cost I, I would agree and I, and I think like any law um there's a start date and people that are before that start date will be you know, are differently impacted than people that are after that start right. date. I mean, you have to you have to pick a date. Um, yeah, just for you can't go back in time forever. Right. Just for clarification purposes, if somebody were to choose to upsize the service, if they're remodeling a home or building a new home and their fixture units dictate their water service is to be upsized, they automatically, even as we sit here, they replace the entirety of the main because they need that larger right. diameter. So that that's kind of a different group. Right. Um, it's those those people that they do they do get a leak in their front yard and then of course that would also apply to the correct and i and i, I agree with trustee hannon that the person that's deciding they want a bigger main or whatever and, sure. and do it because they're remodeling i don't i don't think that would fall into the same category as somebody with a with a with an issue mm -hmm. so i mean it sounds like we're talking the emergency group would be as director Tob said but six to eight a year that have historically have these leaks that would be correct problematic that we want to make sure they don't get charged. Okay, so I, I, I think is is so your last bullet point would be putting a hundred thousand dollars aside for to to kind of pick up these emergencies. Right, that's that's the funding source between now and when we secure funding. However, even though when we secure funding. Our plan that we have to put in place and as to how we're going to use that funding source does not allow, we have to do the mains that we've identified for that year. If these other um, kind of miscellaneous type occurrences pop up, we would also have to have a funding source in place. So this would kind of be in, at least until all the services are replaced where we would need this additional funding source uh, outside of our, you know, whether it's a grant or Trustee Evans. Is there a plan um, yet for when and how we're going to start communicating with the residents about the law and our process? Well, we're kind of doing that right now. That's, this would be the- uh, <laughs> Yeah, but this isn't this, enough. It, well, correct. So we're gonna have a plan in place. You know, we're working on the replacement plan. Um, so notifying a resident as to when it's gonna occur, we don't know yet because we're not at that point. Um, we do have in your packet, we have a, uh, a summary that Christopher Burke Engineering has put together, which we're going to be posting on the website. 
So that gives pretty much all the information that I've alluded to tonight, and that's included in your packet. It has all the information on there. So if somebody has a question, and we'll post it as, as many places as we can. You know. And also there is a plan to work with Riverside TV on a communication piece for residents to kind of explain, because it this, this type of work is really nuanced and there's a lot of details. And so to try to make it a little bit easier for, for residents to understand and digest and kind of understand the different steps along the way, the milestones that we'll have to meet as part of this requirement. Yeah, great. Yeah, we're, we're ahead of this. I mean, I, I think we're the first village yeah, to I mean, start I, discussing. I got an yeah. email from uh, the WCMC a couple weeks ago and they sent it to everybody asking them, what's your plan? And basically they all came back with, we don't have a plan yet. So, I mean, we're, we're you're we're, definitely being proactive about it. So. But yeah, which is, which is good. But I think if, for us to make some decisions, I think we need a little more, a little more detail. Um, how many we're talking about and stuff like that. But I mean, believe, did you get enough guidance to at least start that work? As far as you're talking about the grant middles? The grant and, and how we feel about emergency plans and yeah, things so like that. Yeah, so we're definitely gonna submit the grant uh, paperwork. Sounds like um, from this point until we, actually, it would be ongoing outside of that. So it sounds like if, a, uh, a scenario falls into the bucket of emergency repair, the village is gonna cover the cost of that service in its entirety. Did I understand that correct? Trustee Pollack? That, that's okay with me. I, I think that's a, a, a good approach. I mean, there's, there's no exactly fair way to do it. So let's say for a year, we pay for it. We're not paying for it. The other customers are paying for it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after, and then if we get funding, then the other customers are no longer paying for it because the state government is. So there's no exact way to be fair. But I do think the fairest way is for us to go ahead and pay for it now. If we get the funding, great. We we'll use that. If we don't get the funding, we're going to have to wait and raise our water. Water base, yeah. Then we don't have a choice. Uh, you know, the customers will pay for it one way or another. We've seen noddings of heads. Um, so I guess maybe my other, my last question is more of an internal discussion as to how much we want to set aside. You know, because I, I have proposed 100,000. I don't know if that's a good number until we probably go through a year and see how the thing plays out. But, um, you know, if, the consensus is that the village is going to cover it. Maybe we don't have to set aside a specific amount. And I think we also need to see how the the new proposed percentage shakes out as it as it takes because that that's just taking hold. So I think that would would also help us make that decision. So if I may, um, so a couple of different things we can start tracking it through the analytics director tab can incorporate any of those expenses and. Um, replacements that are done in this monthly public works report for the village board. Um, Dan, if you could pr please provide clarification, um, would we retain the contractor to do the replacement? The village has to oversee all these replacements. Okay. Whether um, we oversee the homeowner hiring a plumber to do it, or we hire the plumber to secure them ourselves. When we do the large scale rollout, we will, of course, have a plumbing firm that is capable of doing that number of replacements that we specify per year. But in the interim, um, I, I foresee it, if we have an issue on our side, we will, of course, have a plumber contact the homeowner and uh, institute the replacement. If a homeowner has an issue on their side, we'll be in conversation with them through the building department. If um, you know we do have a plumber that as a fair price, you know, we'll look at the options, but ultimately we have to oversee the, the change out to make sure it's done properly. Yeah, Trustee Marsaska. I just, uh, for practical purposes, um, are the landscape and hardscape disruptions 
to be borne by the relevant party who's, <laughs> whether it's the village or whether it's the homeowner, is that what the idea is? So the 7,500 is not inclusive of those additional restorations following the replacement. Yeah, so the restoration obviously depends on a lot of, a lot of variables, whether the person has a finished basement, um, where the service is entering the building, if they have landscaping in front of where they would need to potentially dig at the foundation wall. So there's not a real good number that you can just plug in for every case. Um, the $7,500 average does take into account some of that restoration, but if there's restoration beyond, above and beyond what is typically seen, then that's not included in that $7,500. So but it is the, it is the responsibility of the water operator to do those restorative measures. Okay, so for example, when we had plumbing work done this in our yard, they mm -hmm. did a rough, <laughs> a very, very rough, uh, you know, restoration of the soil, but they didn't regrade, they didn't, you know, replace anything. So for instance, when we do the water main project next year and we, we're writing the specifications for how they have to do that work, it will be restore to as good or better condition as it's currently in. Okay. All right, so there will not be extra costs for the homeowner associated with that, absent unusual circumstances. Correct. Um, Trustee Pollock? When, when you're replacing a water service line, do you auger under sidewalks or do you have to open trench everything? There's a few different methods that are, are being used now. Generally speaking, they'll directionally bore that line. Um, there is some some even newer technology coming out that I'm hearing about where they may be able to fish through the lead line and pull the lead line with the new copper line all, all at the same time, which would be great, a lot less restoration involved there, but it's getting that machine is a cost too. So. Generally, it'll be dirt and plant materials that are disrupted, not sidewalks and Correct. large trees. Correct. My, my other thought is, is if, if I mean, plumbers charge so one plumber maybe here, one plumber maybe here. So our, you know, if, if if you know, I choose a plumber that happens to be up here, is there going to be? Is there should there be a set dollar per foot that we will compensate? So we will compensate you, you know. What our plumber would charge would be thirty dollars a foot. Your plumber's charging eighty dollars a foot. Okay, you can have your eighty dollar foot plumber, but we're going to give you thirty dollars a foot. Does that, that make sense? I think that's a good, good thing to implement. Yes, Trustee Bob. And, and then that begs the question: Is it cheaper for residents to hire their own plumber because they don't have to pay prevailing wage? <laughs> that doesn't have to be answered now, but that's something to consider and. Yeah, when we decide whether we do it or they do it. Right. Now, when we, if and when we do get funding from IEPA, it's on the village yeah. to do. But in those other circumstances, yeah, that's a good thing to consider. Okay. Well, those are, I think, things we need to, those are all the questions we need to shake out. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank so you. So I have one more. I apologize. No problem. We'll make it quick. Uh, if it's determined to be practical, of course, within the finance department, is the board willing to move up water main replacement projects to help facilitate the lead service line replacement schedule? But what I mean uh, when I say that is, if funding becomes available on an annual basis at $4 million per year, it doesn't make sense to replace service lines on a four inch main to just have to do it potentially you know, five or 10 years later. You don't want to put a new service on a four inch main that's been in the ground for 70 years, right? So if we come across or we get to that point where we're on that street and this four inch main has not been replaced yet, is the board willing to, um, assuming financing is available, kind of escalate some of those water main replacement projects to help streamline this replacement project? Because right now in our 10 year, we have we have a fair amount of four-inch water main that we're replacing. But outside of that, there is probably five roads that 
we haven't addressed yet that are not currently in our CIP. So bringing those five roads potentially into the mix to help facilitate and streamline this lead service line placement well, obviously will take a cost. Um, I've estimated in today's dollars, we're looking at $2 million to hit the, the unfunded four inch water main. So obviously we would have to look internally at a funding source, but do we want to start the process to see if that's even feasible? I would think you should, you would want to bring everything to us to, to, to see what's feasible and what's not feasible and what's the most economical, the most streamlined way to do things. I mean, we want to, we want to do it. We want to do it right. We want to do it the most economical way to do it. Yeah, I would say the uh, kind of the next stage in this is we submit for the funding. We hear back on the funding and then we come back to the board with a proposed plan as to where we're going to address and when with that potentially escalated water main replacement this schedule. also ties into our streets too because we're it, it's all taken into consideration yeah. okay it's, like i said a lot of variables to try to make the most efficient and cost effective replacement <clears throat> program possible you know we have 17 years to do this starting in 2027 but if we get that funding year after year you know the way we know have it laid out right now which is, of course is very early it will be done in 10 years I would I so 10 years would be I would assume that it would be cheaper to do it in 10 years than it would be do it in 20 yeah today a lot costs. cheaper than 20 years from 20 now, years from now's dollars so yeah okay everybody good perfect um, thank you Dan appreciate sure. it uh, thank you Orion for coming yeah. Um, trustee reports and communication. Are there any trustee reports or communications tonight? Okay, hearing none, um, the board uh, does have need for an executive session tonight to discuss the appointment, appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body and to discuss and setting the price of sale lease of village property. The board will not convene to take uh, final action, so I'd like to ask for a motion and a second to adjourn this meeting. To adjourn to executive session. Uh, motion by Trustee Galagos. Second. I'll second. Second by Trustee Evans. Uh, Ethan, if you'd please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshazga. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, meeting is adjourned. It was a long meeting. A um, lot to go over. I Thank you very much for your patience and for your input. It was good.